Now that we spend so much time with microeconomics, we should also move one step further forward to macroeconomics. And um, I will do that by first, um, well, by the discussion of the micro foundations of macroeconomics. Who is familiar with the, with the terminology micro foundations of macroeconomics? Is that absolute standard? Everyone knows it? Uh, who has never heard of that? Micro foundations? More or less all familiar or all shy, anyway. All right. Anyway, so I'm going to explain it anyway. So the outline is this, literature, general literature, and then I present one particular um, uh, journal article by Hoover. Hoover is a well-known, well, I say something about it, and then I'll have critical comments on Hoover. Now, that Hoover uh, 2015, that's the central text, Reduction, oh, I didn't write that uh, central text and, and also for the exam. So this is the first one which you should read for the exam, and I ask you to read that if you haven't read it uh, until the next session. Although I present it, but I will rather go quickly to the, present, to the uh, presentation. You can read the article itself. I will clarify certain things, and then we'll have uh, the critical discussion. There are supplementary texts. Uh, Hoover is really... Uh, in philosophy of economics, he is really the, uh, the main uh, person who discusses microfoundation, and uh, he has already the title shows that he's a philosopher, reductionism in economics, intentionality and eschatological justifications in the microfoundations of macroeconomics. That sounds very important, doesn't it? Eschatological justification. It's in philosophy of science, so. Uh, uh, pre-judgment is uh, presupposition. It must be a good article. Uh, Hoover has written since 2000 many articles on that. He's also written a, an interesting book on macro, several books in macroeconomics. So uh, Hoover in 2008 does macroeconomics need micro foundations? Good questions. And uh, then again, a title where you think, wow, that must be important. Micro foundations and the ontology of macroeconomics. Uh, you may have had uh, macroeconomics classes. I guess the word ontology of macroeconomics never ever turned up, right? Anyone turned up that the professor said, yeah, you, you see, you, you've got to understand the ontology of macroeconomics is such and such. No, no economists will say that. Anyway, so, oh, there's something else. Yeah, you could read. I've worked for a long time, uh, really for a long time, on various aspects on reductionism, uh, for instance, in biology, and there you can read something. Then I have something uh, that's unfortunately in German, very, very general uh, if you're interested, you, uh, you can have a look. And then uh, here is a very important article by Kerman, uh, whom or what does the representative individual uh, represent in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. And uh, those who did enough macroeconomics are probably aware of that, and it will be a part of, uh, of Hoover's exposure. So, oh, don't I have here on Hoover? Oh, yeah, I have also. So Hoover, also an older gentleman, professor of economics and philosophy. And he's really had a career in economics, in macroeconomics. He really knows what he's talking about. I personally, of course, cannot really judge that. But one of my colleagues, a um, uh, very um, uh, established uh, guy in, in philosophy of economics who works now in China, and he told me Hoover is the only one he trusts when it comes to, to macroeconomics. Hoover is the one who really knows what macroeconomics is all about. And therefore, of course, it's highly interesting when he speaks about the macro, micro foundations of macroeconomics than he really knows what macroeconomics is. So, professor of economics and earlier positions at the Federal Reserve Bank and several other universities. So he was also in practice, not only in, academy, in academia, but really he was uh, worked for the Federal Reserve Bank. So that's, of course, a candidate similar to Agnew and says, okay, for me as an outsider, these are people where I can probably learn something from because they know what they're talking about. Pertinent publication, and this is uh, the new classical macroeconomics, a skeptical inquiry from Oxford, um, uh, 1988. Causality in macroeconomics that also has a chapter in the micro foundations. Um, and the Journal of Philosophy of Science, I mentioned it already, one of the top journals in philosophy of science since 1934, the official journal of the Philosophy of Science Association in the United States, which is the biggest one. So uh, the, I'm just trying to, to, uh, to raise your appetite. This must be a good uh, article with a good author, and we want to understand what he has to say. The outline of the article is this. 
he first says something, and um, today I'm doing it a little slower, but next time for the rest I will speed up. And be, uh, Then you have read the article, Reductionism and the Practice of Macroeconomics, then the Problems of ma Micro Foundations in the Origin of Macroeconomics, then Intentionality and Causality, then Against Eschatological Justification, whatever that is, yeah, and Recapitulation, and here we go. So... Uh, I'm now just presenting without many critical remarks, but just uh, trying to clarify uh, what Hoover is saying in his article and in his first section. He says um, that one view of reductionism, and uh, we're speaking about something of a reduction of macroeconomics to microeconomics, um, one view of reduction is that there are more fundamental and more specialized sciences constituting a chain of dependence. So we have there is a chain of dependence of sciences by reduction, and if you read this arrow as reduces to, then, for example, macroeconomics somehow reduces to microeconomics. Right? So you can build up somehow macroeconomics from microeconomics. That's the basic idea. Or microeconomics may reduce to psychology, because microeconomics is about choices, choices are in some understanding, psycho psychological, based, psychology based. So, microeconomics reduced to psychology. Psychology reduces to biology because we are human, we are um, um, animals also. So, all our uh, psychological life is based on our biology, brain, and so on, evolution. And biology, then, of course, evolutionary biology. We can understand what, we, what our dispositions are by understanding our evolution. And then, if you look at, at us, well, by Basically, we are chemical systems, right? So um, the evolution and the biology must be explainable, reducible to chemistry. And if you look at chemistry, chemistry deals with molecules, and molecules are put together by, by atoms, right? So we can go to atomic physics. And then if you look at atomic physics, then, uh, well, atoms um, are, uh, themselves are composed of different particles. And then you go to fun most fundamental physics, to quarks or whatever, and strings and what I know. So that's the, that's the basic idea that um, Hoover shows here. And uh, this idea was very popular in philosophy in the 1950s. Today you'd find, find that nowhere in this specialized uh, discussion about reduction emergence and that stuff. But Hoover takes that up as uh, the background idea, uh, and there is this background idea that we have sciences you know, who, that deal with more complex items, and the complex items can be decomposed in simpler items, and somehow you can understand the complex items by understanding their components. And for the components, typically other sciences are in charge. So if, as we are biology, so you look at biology, then we have organisms, and you can decompose them in, well, in the end, in, in, in molecules, for instance, and then you say, what? Who is, what's the science of molecules? Well, molecular science or chemistry, for instance, right? And then you study the molecules in order to understand the complicated system. And, and that you can do in this chain, and as I said, this chain idea was really very popular in philosophy of science in the 1950s, and that, of course, also fed the assumption or conviction of many people, the most fundamental science is physics, because in the end, everything, all this complex stuff, sociology, macroeconomics, boom, 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 via a series of steps, ends with physics. So in the end, and this is what many physicists uh, there in elementary particle physics also said, our discipline is the most fundamental one. And in principle, we can understand everything because we are physicists and we look at the fundamental um, parts of everything that exists, right? And that is this reduction idea behind that. I'm just representing it. I'm not judging it, right? It's just uh, it has some plausibility, no doubt. Okay. And uh, however, what one, what one, after some discussion, one sees that, and that was certainly from the 60s, 1960s on, that became clear. When you say, okay, macroeconomics reduces to microeconomics, what that exactly means is not that clear. So you may say, yeah, that's somehow plausible because macro is macroeconomics, where it's the aggregation uh, of stuff from the micro level, and therefore it reduces to the macro level. So sounds good, but once you ask, you know, what do you mean exactly by reducing to, then it becomes fuzzy, and one will see there are different meanings involved. Oh, that doesn't belong here because it's not an empirical science. Okay. Mathematics is about nothing. Mathematics has no 
subject matter out in the world. That's a different thing. They are what? They are all empirical disciplines. They are all about things in the world. Well, that's a different story. Yes, that's right. But still, mathematics is something else. So normal mathematicians don't. Well, many pure mathematicians don't want to have anything to do with the applications. Right? It's dirty, right? No. And as soon as you apply it, then you have no, no strict proofs anymore. So it's dirty and it's lyrics. <coughs> So for mathematicians, either you have the proof or it's poetry. Okay, this is slightly exaggerated, but only slightly, <laughs> and not 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 even always. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so mathematics is just an analytical science. It's something very, very, very different from the other sciences, notwithstanding the applicability of mathematics for the empirical sciences. That's a separate problem. Could be a seminar by itself. So. What this reduces mean that uh, Ho Hoover says has, uh, there are several possibilities, and uh, he sees three possibilities. Uh, one is elimination, that the reduced science is strictly speaking dispensable, given the reduced science is fully understood. So, for instance, economics with respect to psychology. If we fully understand psychology, then we can eliminate economics, microeconomics, because everything we can say about choices can be said in psychology. So that's his idea. So a reduced science is strictly speaking dispensable. And this is, by the way, the main, one of the main motives of Hoover's reluctance to accept reductionism. He is a macroeconomist, and he thinks as soon as you have reduced macroeconomics to microeconomics, macroeconomics becomes dispensable, right? It'll be destroyed. And because he's a macroeconomist, he doesn't want that. Now, this is a psychological thing, what I'm saying now, but that's quite obvious, and we will have substantial arguments. This you find in many, many places, that those people who work in a scientific field that is going to be reduced, or what people say, we should reduce it, there's very often their reaction, I don't want to have that because then you, this field is eliminated. But this is my, my hometown, right? I don't want to give it up, right? And they're very sad then. So you find that in biology, the same. Then when people, and some people say, look, biology is basically uh, molecular biology, molecular science. Then some biologists say, oh, you want to want to destroy biology. That must be, not be the case. I'm a zoologist, right? And no, 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 it must not do that. So this is just, I'm just describing a psychological uh, background, so to speak. And this is very important here. So uh, f for Hoover, re reduction um, always has the danger or intention, we come to more detail there, of elimination, right? And once uh, you own the, the subject you love and have done for 30 years or something, then you hate, of course, if someone says, I'm taking this toy away from you, right? And you become something else. But uh, you, this discipline doesn't exist anymore. And this is his fair here. So elimination. The other one, <coughs> so uh, again, we're speaking about different things, what what reduction means in Hoover's view, and the other is ontology, uh, namely that uh, e economics does not trade in any mysterious stuff over and above psychology. Um, so it's not easy to understand what he's saying here. Right? Basically, he says, look, if you look at macroeconomics and look at, at the things that exist in macroeconomics, basically they are composed of the stuff we know from the micro level, right? by aggregation, typically, but perhaps it's more complicated. Uh, so what he says is, and it would be mysterious if you say, look, on the macro, macroeconomic level, there is stuff that is completely different from what you know from the micro level. Then you would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, that should, what, that, what should that be? Well, it can't be. I mean, it's aggregation, maybe complicated, the aggregation, but in the end, it's just aggregation, nothing more, period, right? And there he seems to Agree. So macroeconomics does not trade in any mysterious stuff. And the mysterious stuff would be stuff that could not be reduced to the micro level. Stuff, right? Whatever stuff is. Okay. All right. And then C, his third uh, possibility is uh, economic concepts, explanation, economic concepts are not eliminated, but psychology explains why they are what they are. 
right? If, if you think about that, I, ha I had problems understanding what he means, but it must be something like that, that uh, if you reduce, or, or one, one way of understanding what a reduction could mean, reduce um, microeconomics to psychology, and then psychology explains to you what the economic concepts, why the economic concepts are what they are. Okay? Then that would mean that psychology explains to you why preferences are what they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As it's not, not utterly clear, right, what he means. But this is what he writes. I'm just citing. Anyway, um, I shall comment on this class classification later in my comments. I think it's a very, very, very unfortunate classification. Uh, and, so, and if you only understand half of it, uh, don't worry. Um, uh, we'll discuss it later. Okay. Now, his own position vis-à-vis -vis this uh, three uh, possibilities is that um, he rejects A, the elimination for pragmatic reasons. Why? Because psychology is yet underdeveloped. So that's purely pragmatic. You say, look, the reduction isn't possible. Why not? Because the reducing science is not yet enough developed. Therefore, no chance, and therefore we need the upper level. Right? That's, in principle, a good argument. And B, namely that the ontology is uh, somehow accepted and one doesn't really know whether he means fundamental physics in the, in the end uh, there anyway. And he accepts C, namely he says, yes, there is a sort of reduction, namely that we can understand the uh, concepts uh, of economics by means of um, psychology. All right, um, this, well, there is not much of an argument, right? Anyway. So what he's going to discuss then is the more restricted question, namely the reduction of macroeconomics to microeconomics. First, this was this large picture, you know, from, from macroeconomics down to elementary particle physics, and, and now, and, and now the, the different concepts. Um, and now he's, he's getting more focused um, and, uh, on the relationship between macro and microeconomics. And then he says that most econ economists believe that there is a reductive dependence of macroeconomics on microeconomics called micro foundations of macroeconomics. Uh, so this is the topic. It's a dependence of the macro level on the micro level. And that has, of course, some initial plausibility given you understand that macroeconomics has this aggregated variables, aggregated from the micro level. And there we continue next time. Thank you very much. <laughs> The point here is the critical term is here uh, reductive dependence because it's not really clear what that dependence is and that has to be clarified and, and spelled out um, and we'll do that uh, in course of the, 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 the class today. Um, when he says most economists believe that there is, I'm always very careful about people speaking if about in general about their own profession or whatever that because there is no quantitative um, investigation on that. So this is his impression. I do not believe my own impressions about my own field. I'm not believing when I say, I think most philosophers of science believe this and that. I don't believe myself. I only believe it if we have a questionnaire and a social scientific investigations. We form prejudices no end about many things we are familiar with. So, okay, so he says that. I don't know whether it's true or not because I don't have a quantitative investigation of that. Anyway, it's called Micro Foundations of Macroeconomics. Um, and then comes the, the next step here, uh, as reduction in terms of an agent-by-agent agent account is not feasible. So an agent-by-agent agent account means that you try to understand or reduce what happens at the macro level by analyzing in terms of what every agent on the micro level does, every individual consumer and every firm, right? Because the basic idea is that, of course, what happens at the macro level is the aggregation of what happens at the micro level. That seems to be rather trivial. So you could, in principle, one would say, understand what's happening at the upper level, at the macro level, if you understood everything at the micro level and were able to, to aggregate it, right? So as this is not possible, agent by agent account is not feasible, this is what he says, and I think he's absolutely right. Most reductive work is done in terms of a representative agent whose decision problem stands for the whole economy. 
So you're probably familiar with it. You just say what happens at the macro level is the result of one agent with preferences and all of that and decisions. And you describe the macro level as if it was the work of one individual, right? And that individual is then called representative agent. Now, what he says that... Uh, also in, in the course of the article, that those people who uh, use representative agent models do that with a reductive idea in the back of their mind. I'm not sure, because if you compare that with other uh, areas, say physics or something, or biology or chemistry, well, first of all, it's not very plausible to use the same sort of mechanism that works at the lower level for the upper level. So if you think in biology and you say, I want to understand what a living organism is, and then you say, I go down to the level of molecules, and then you simulate uh, an eagle as a single molecule, right? That's not very plausible, and it's certainly not a step towards a reduction. So, but there may be, oh, if you say you, you, you simulate a gas that consists of atoms by a single atom, not very plausible may work, I don't know, it depends, but it, uh, seeing it as a step towards a reduction is not utterly plausible. Some people may believe that, whether all people believe it, I would doubt it, and we'll see that later, there's a footnote also where a referee said, this is not necessarily true what you say here. Okay, so uh, the basic idea there of macroeconomics using representative agents is just an idea of macroeconomics. I don't find it utterly plausible, but that's not a good argument because sometimes in science things are not very plausible. If they work, fine. Yes, please.